What's up, future family? If you're tuning in for the regular design content that we normally broadcast, this is probably not the episode for you. But if you're like me and uh, people from all over the world who are concerned about this rapidly evolving situation with COVID-19, the coronavirus, you're going to want to stick around. Why are we doing this episode? First, there's so much information that's going around on the internet. Uh, we don't know what to believe or what to believe. We got to start to separate fact from fiction. And I, I have the privilege to talk to Dr. Otto Yang today. And I just want to share a really brief story here. My friend, Dr. Shelly Metten from UCLA, she's like, I know the person you need to bring on the show. He specializes in infectious disease. So I'm going to bring him on the show in just a second. So here's a couple of things that you need to know about Dr. Otto Yang. He uh, specializes in infectious disease, as I've mentioned. He's a professor at UCLA since 1999. He's also a board member of Applied Medical. He's a scientific researcher doing really important things, developing immune therapies and vaccines for HIV, cancer, and other viral infections. He's also uh, working on nanoparticles, uh, these things called vaults, as a possible vaccine. And he's very highly educated in this field, and so we're just thrilled to have him. He went to Brown Medical School. He also went to NYU to study internal medicine, where he did his residency training. He also went to Harvard, uh, where he specialized in infectious disease, where he also taught for over two years. Dr. Otto Yang, thank you very much for coming on the show. Everybody, help me welcome Dr. Otto Yang. Woo! Yeah, Dr. Woo! Yang! Okay, so we're thrilled to have you. I, I just want to start off with just some basic ground level knowledge. What is the coronavirus? Have we seen something like this before? Uh, just get us up to speed on what the coronavirus is. Uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're almost completely breaking up. I couldn't hear. Oh, okay. Just, can you just tell us what the coronavirus is, what it isn't? So we, we kind of have an understanding of this. Uh, okay. Uh, so the coronavirus, it's, it's uh, what we call an RNA virus. Uh, and it, this, is one of a whole family of viruses that uh, actually it's related to several viruses that have already been circulating um, every year for decades. So there are at least four other coronaviruses and those viruses cause very mild infections. That they actually account for up to 30% uh, of the common cold that's seen every year during uh, cold and flu season. Um, and so these are viruses that tend to infect cells in the respiratory tract, uh, starting anywhere from the nose uh, and mouth all the way down to the lungs. And as I said, those other four uh, generally cause very mild infections and have mostly been ignored, even though we've known about them, because uh, except for some exceptions like very young children or very severely immunocompromised patients who can get severe disease, uh, overall, they, they cause very mild symptoms and very mild disease, and so they've been ignored until 2002. And then in 2002, the first serious coronavirus disease uh, came to our awareness, and that was SARS. Um, and SARS uh, was an, a coronavirus that made a species jump, um, originally from bats, probably, into uh, another small animal, probably the civet cat, and then into humans. Um, and SARS uh, swept through pretty quickly different parts of the world, caused quite a few deaths, had a very high mortality rate of about 10%. Uh, but fortunately, uh, it disappeared almost as quickly as it came. Uh, and no scientist at that time would have predicted that would have happened. But somehow that happened, and it was probably a combination of uh, good public health practices to control its spread and some other natural factors we don't really understand. Uh, and then we didn't hear about any other se severe coronaviruses until about 2012 when MERS came out, uh, our Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That again was another bat coronavirus. So bats carry thousands of different coronaviruses and most of them stay uh, contained in their original species of bats, but uh, this one also made a leap, and it looks like this one came through camels into humans. Uh, wow. And then mares um, had an even higher mortality rate of about 30%. Um, and it, uh, unlike SARS, it, it has never gone away completely, so there are occasional outbreaks still, but um, it has been pretty easy to contain with public health measures and keep those outbreaks from becoming widespread. And so now this virus is 
uh, fairly similar to the original SARS. It's about 86% genetically similar. Um, it also almost certainly came from bats. There's some debate about uh, how it jumped into humans. It looks like there's some evidence that may have been from pangolins. Um, and this one, uh, unfortunately, has shown a great, greater capacity to spread than either of those other two more serious or higher mortality coronaviruses. Okay. So I, I, I think I kind of understand this. It seems like you're saying, and hopefully you can still hear me, that we, uh, yep. the bats carry a lot of disease and, and then the species jump, which, which is where we get into trouble. And what's the... What's the uh, the uh, hypothesis on, on on why this is happening, or or why is it happening more frequently? It seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of that's an area of a lot of interest and a lot of discussion. It's probably multiple factors. Um, so a big one, I think, that most scientists cite is that there is um, a lot of habitat loss of animals, and so the frequency of exposure between animals and humans is increasing over time as, as uh, there's more crowding between animals and humans because of habitat loss. So that, that's a, a big one, a big factor probably, but mm -hmm. nobody understands for sure. Okay, so habitat loss, is there any other reasons why you, you're seeing this happening more now? Uh, that's probably the major one, and then I think the other the other major thing is uh, human, uh, both human crowding because of population increase, right? So diseases that spread from human to human spread more efficiently when humans are closer together. Mm -hmm. And then also the greater interconnectedness of uh, people across the world, right? So now people travel uh, by airplane all over the place. There's a lot more mixing of people than there used to be, right? So in 1918, when there was the great Spanish flu, um, there were no airplanes, there were no, and even then, that virus spread and killed a lot of people. So things are just that much worse now in terms of uh, the opportunity for a virus to spread through human populations. Right. Okay, so this is going to take me to my next question, which is, I I don't I don't know. There's countries where there's full like military lockdown on this to try to contain the virus, and then I hear about friends in certain parts of Europe and other parts of the world where people are literally still out in the bars drinking, like they're not taking this seriously at all. So, what is in your estimation the threat level? I, I don't know how to react right now. I don't know if I'm under preparing or I'm over preparing. Yeah, so that uh, that's a very complicated issue. Um, the general threat level to society is very high. Um, this virus, experts are estimating it has the capacity to infect 50% of the people in the United States. Um, and the good news is that the mortality level is probably not as high as currently being reported, and that's because testing has been very heavy, heavily biased towards people that are ill. Um, and there's been little, little testing of people that are less ill or have you know, very mild symptoms. Um, so the current mortality estimate is like 3 to 4%. It's probably not nearly that high um, under if you were to find everybody that was, te that was actually infected, include everyone that had mild infections. But it's still most likely at least 0.5%. And that's 10 to 20 times worse than uh, seasonal flu, uh, than typical seasonal flu. I'm not talking about like the bad outbreaks in the past, but just the regular one we see every year. Um, so that's probably 10 or 20 times the rate of that. And the normal flu in an average year in, the, in this country, in the United States, kills about 30 to 40,000 people. Um, and you know, it, um, on top of that, you know, that's despite the fact that uh, we have a vaccine for the flu. Um, and so a lot of the spread is slowed and a lot of severe disease is prevented by the vaccine. So this could definitely be much, much worse than that. Mm, wow. Okay, so if you were to put on a scale of 1 to 10, the, the common flu would rank in at what between 1 and 10 in terms of a threat level? Um, yeah, this is very highly subjective, right. so I, I guess I might 
you know, put it at somewhere like a two or a three. And then this virus, I don't know, seven, eight. Wow. Okay. So in orders of magnitude greater. Uh, okay. So you're saying the common flu kills about 30 to 40,000 people a year, despite us having vaccines and being able to control or at least limit the, the spread of the contagion. And you're saying also that the coronavirus is 10 to 20 times more deadly than the common flu? Yes. So are we looking yes. at a potential uh, casualty or mortality rate or number in the, the hundreds of thousands in America alone? Uh, yeah, there are estimates that easily will be over a million. Wow. Uh, so, right. So it, it is definitely something of serious concern. Um, and, of course, uh, that risk, the risk of death is not even across the population, right? So some people are definitely much more at risk than others. Mm. We've heard that it seems like people that have respiratory problems or people, I guess the, the median age or something like that is uh, 80 years old or something like that? Is that? Right, right. So uh, definitely people that have predisposing chronic medical illnesses are at much higher risk. So people with diabetes. Uh, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, um, they're at higher risk. And then the other major, major risk is age. So the, if you trust the data coming out of China, which is a, another long conversation, but if you trust the data coming out of China, the risk of dying um, starts to rise very, very gradually at, in young adulthood. And then takes off rapidly around age 45 or 50. Um, so it's kind of an exponential curve. So it's very flat at the beginning in the younger ages, and it takes off very quickly, starting in probably the early to mid-40s. Uh-oh. And people that are older have a much higher, definitely have a much higher mortality rate. Okay, so I'm definitely moving into the upper age group here, so I'm a little concerned. As, yeah. as regular... <laughs> Unfortunately, as regular listeners to the show might notice, my throat or my voice sounds a little hoarse, you guys, because I, I am recovering from a cold. I can't shake what I've got. So, okay, this brings me, like, do I have coronavirus? Like, how do I know and when should I go to take a test? I don't want to be pigheaded about this, but I also don't want to be hypochondriac and just, like, waste a test when somebody else really needs it. Yeah, very good question. Uh, so... The clinical experience with this coronavirus has been that the really defining symptoms are fever and cough. Um, those are the two major ones that pretty much everybody has. Uh, unfortunately, of course, there's a lot of overlap um, with other viral infections. Um, the, this virus seems a little different than a lot of the other respiratory viruses in that uh, although it can infect cells in what we call the upper respiratory tract. So you define the upper respiratory tract as being you know, from the neck up. Um, so that includes the mouth, the sinuses, the nose. Um, although it does infect those cells, it actually tends to move very rapidly down into the lungs, the lower respiratory tract. Um, and so actually uh, a runny nose you know, or sneezing, those types of uh, symptoms actually are not very typical and suggest against having this coronavirus. Are there any other symptoms like uh, that I should be aware of? Like, so I read online, see, this is the problem with reading stuff online. You never know because people don't even cite sources and then copy paste and then you, you've lost all ability to find the provenance of where this information comes from. Like somebody had written, if you take a deep breath and you hold your breath for 10 seconds and if you don't feel like you have to cough, it's a good sign. And if you feel like you have to cough, maybe there's already some issues there. Uh, can you shed some light yeah. on this? Yeah, I've seen that. That's that uh, supposed Stanford yes. board yes. something. Or, it's bad or information? It's, yeah, it's total bullshit. Um, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know when a doctor says that? It just carries more weight, you guys, I have to say. Okay. Because I suspected the yeah. person who posted it, like, I don't think you do a very good job of, uh, of this kind of information. And so here we are. So you've dispelled one of those things already. Yeah, I mean, the problem, so a lot of that's kind of stuff circulating. The problem is that it, what it does is it'll mix something that's valid and you're hearing from, you know, trusted authorities like wash your hands a lot, right? And then they'll start throwing in stuff that makes absolutely no sense, like, you know, gargling with the salt water and 
taking a deep breath and seeing if you have lung fibrosis. And, you know, it, it really, it's just really a lot of hogwash. It just, but it's cloaked in a way that makes it sound like it's going to be reasonable. So, yeah, we have to really be careful about that. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I've been posting a lot about this on social media on my account. And, uh, you know, basically what I've been telling people is trust nobody. Um, don't even trust me. What? <laughs> try, try anything that, that you hear, you know, try to cross reference that against reliable sources and make sure that you're seeing the true kind of scientific consensus from experts, from reliable sources. Um, don't take any one person's opinion too heavily. Uh, even, you know, even someone that's fairly expert, you know, be careful about what they say um, because everyone has their own implicit, own, own biases and own thoughts and own theories. And scientists especially will espouse their own theories and other scientists may not agree. Right. Dr. Yang, I have a question. A lot of people are asking if there is an immune booster. What would your, what would your answer be to that if I'm trying to make myself even healthier than I already am? Yeah, I, I was walking by CVS uh, two days ago, and the whole immune booster, booster shelf was completely empty, which was crazy. Um, there is no magic pill. There is no magic solution. Um, you know, the immune system, you know, first of all, it's not one system. It's, it's a really complicated a mixture of different systems that we don't really understand that well. But in general... Uh, taking care of your health overall, so making sure there's good nutrition, you're not overweight, um, just your health, your health in general is the best thing to make sure you take care of. So if you have diabetes, make sure your diabetes is under good control. Um, you know, make sure you don't have chronic lung disease, don't smoke, you know, just, it's really just basics like that. There, there is no nothing, you know, generally in life, you don't get something for nothing. So there's no, no way to just take a pill and make sure your immune system is boosted. Thank you. Right. So, so no easy answers on that one. Mm -hmm. Are there other, are there any other myths that you can bust for us really quickly? Just because I know everybody's been reading different things, either home remedies or weird, witch doctory kind of things that you've heard of that just so we can dispel some of that. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, things that I've been seeing on Facebook and laughing about, um, uh, essential oils, um, <laughs> you know, the, the whole, that whole Stanford stuff about the gargling yes. and, and, uh, drink water to flush it down into your stomach and all that. That's, uh, that stuff makes no sense. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, well, there's, there's the whole topic about, uh, masks. Yes. And, so there's a lot of information and misinformation, both intentional and due to confusion there, which I think you both um, are talk <laughs> talking about a bit. Um, so there's, there's been confusion, I think, um, because part of it has been that the CDC information has been a little bit conflicting, right? Mm -hmm. So he has been telling people, well, you don't need masks. Don't worry. Don't bother about needing masks. And then at the same time, um, and so this has been pointed out to me on, on social media when I've, you know, said that I basically agree with that. Um, it's the same time it's been pointed out, well, the CDC is saying that doctors need to wear N95 respirators, you know, so does that mean that, that there's this conspiracy that ordinary people don't need to be protected and go, can go ahead and get sick. And there's a separate class of, of rules for protecting doctors and nurses. And, and I, I can explain to you the reason for that kind of confusion. So, um, and I think to explain that, I need to kind of go back a little bit and explain what, how the virus spreads. And if you understand how the virus spreads, then you can kind of understand the reasoning behind the face mask recommendations and what you should do. So uh, the first thing is people talk about the virus spreading through the air um, and media has been kind of really touting that. And, and so that is scary, right? So there are two ways that viruses can spread through the air. Um, and the medical community classifies them as one, aerosol, and two, droplet. And so let me explain to you the difference between aerosol and droplet. So when a person coughs or sneezes or even talks, uh, there's, there are respiratory secretions that come out 
into the air from their mouth or nose. Those can be subdivided into the aerosol or droplet. So aerosol is the very, very fine mist that can float around in the air uh, for minutes or even hours. Uh, and of course, if you're in the same room as that person or anywhere near that person, that mist, you can inhale it. Right, so if there's live virus, enough virus in the person's secretions to be uh, in that mist, then you can get sick, get the infection from them. So this is the classic case with measles um, and with tuberculosis. Um, and so that's why, for example, at uh, Disneyland, there were outbreaks of measles because unvaccinated kids were walking around and just breathed in the air from other kids. So, you know, there are studies showing that if somebody has measles and and you don't have immunity and you're in the same room with them for a few minutes, like the chance is almost 100% you'll get, get the measles. Okay, so as far as we know, um, uh, this virus does not spread that way. Um, and when I say as far as we know, there's a lot of evidence that it does not. Um, so, and the very closely related virus, SARS, the original one, um, that one, there's, there was a lot of observational evidence of patients that it does not spread that way. It was never observed. All, all spread could be explained by the other pathway, the droplet pathway. So what is the droplet pathway? So the droplet pathway are drops of fluid that coming out that are too large to float, that drop to the ground uh, by gravity uh, as soon as they're expelled. So they don't travel, um, they just fall from wherever that the person expelled them. So unless you're directly in the face of that person who's coughing or sneezing, um, and those droplets go right into uh, a vulnerable part of your body, which would be your mouth or nose or eyes, um, the droplets will not cause you to get infected. The big asterisk to that is that droplets land on surfaces, and if you touch a surface, you can pick up what's in that droplet and move it then to your to your vulnerable areas by touching your face. Right. So that, uh, as far as we know, and based on fairly good evidence so far, is how this virus spreads, and that is exactly how the prior SARS virus spread, and this is how many or most of the known respiratory viruses spread, including. Uh, flu. Okay, so knowing this now, what do you need to do to protect yourself? So one is that a lot of this, most of it is actually due to touching a contaminated surface. That's why there's all this hand washing advice. Uh, the other now is regarding masks. So if you know this to be true, an N95 respirator is not needed because the N95 is used to filter out aerosol. Um, and the CDC was being extra super conservative when it made that recommendation for healthcare workers to use N95 masks. Um, and that was conservative because they didn't want the medical workforce, which is important for caring for us, to, be, to get infected in the course of caring for us. And also it was out of caution because it was still early and it was still not that clear. Um, as time has passed now, the CDC has actually relaxed that criterion. And at UCLA Medical Center, for example, we have now moved to drop the precautions away from using N95 masks. So even the medical staff um, are not using N95s. The exception to that is if you're doing some procedure where there's very high exposure and a lot of fluid is generated from the patient because of the procedure. But otherwise, it's just regular masks. And so in the public, then, um, as I've told you, you don't get exposed unless there's direct exposure to your face. So a mask is not necessary or shouldn't be necessary if you're just casually walking around in the public. So if somebody several feet away, a rouse, sneezes or coughs, those drop the, the infectious material, the droplets are not going to fly through the air and land in your mouth. Um, they're going to land on the floor or on the shelf or whatever near that person. So, you know, the mask, the a regular surgical mask doesn't ask, act as a filter. It actually ask, acts as a physical barrier. So it does make sense if you are, for example, taking care 
of somebody that has this disease, right? So if you're, you're taking care of them, they're in bed, and you're face-to-face -face with them and they're coughing, the mask will protect you from the splash of the droplets landing uh, on you. Um, and there's also probably some protection in terms of if you touch your face and you touch the mask instead of touching your nose, that may be protective as well. So under normal circumstances, if you're not in a very crowded area and you can maintain distance from the people you're with, uh, a mask is not necessary. I see. So hopefully that kind of provides some clarity. That provides a tremendous amount of clarity. Whew. Okay. So I, I had read somewhere, somebody posted on Facebook that Taiwan is sending 100,000 masks to the U.S. each week or something like that. Is, is that unnecessary then based on what you just said? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's unnecessary probably for the general public, um, but it would make sense if, if people were going to be taking care of family members or relatives who um, are sick. And it might make sense if you are going into a very high-risk area. So, for example, you know, the CDC recommendations don't specifically address what to do if you're going to an airport or sitting on an airplane. It might make some sense to wear a mask where you have no choice but to be very close to people, like standing in line and um, in the airport waiting to go through security. Uh, so there are definitely, there's a role for masks, um, and that might make sense. And um, also, while, while I'm, I'm here, let me uh, give a shout out. Actually, my cousin is the Minister of Health in Taiwan, so they've done uh, an amazing job. And the WHO have held up Taiwan and Singapore as model countries for how they've handled uh, COVID-19. Yeah, I have to be honest. I saw that, and I was thinking, uh, my wife's from Taiwan. I was thinking, honey, it's time to take a trip to Taiwan, but they're not allowing U.S. people to through anymore. So I don't know. Uh, it does seem yeah. like certain. You know, actually, so your your wife and my wife are both Taiwanese citizens, and they um, apparently the government is is mailing them to Taiwanese. You, as a Taiwanese citizen, you have a right to a certain number of masks. I did. I just heard that last night. I have, oh. I'm not sure if that's true. That's what I heard. So yeah, she can write to Taiwan and get some masks. Okay. All right. Now, there's a shortage of masks right now because the demand has spiked, right? And if I'm in a room, this is one of those weird hypothetical questions where I only have one mask and one person has the coronavirus and one person's healthy, who should be wearing the mask? The person who's sick or the person who's healthy? Oh, by far, uh, that's an easy one, That the person who's sick, uh, right? Because the, if they cover their mouth and nose, I mean, that's the only portal for the virus to, to make its escape from the person and get to another person. Um, maybe there's a mild, mild exception. There's some suggestion that maybe stool can um, carry the virus, although if you're exposed to a person's stool, you're really in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> but uh, in general, the virus is going to be spread. So uh, if they wear a mask, that will prevent them from, number one, coughing directly into you, and number two, contaminating environmental surfaces around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it makes much more sense for the sick person to to wear the mask. And in, in the hospital, that's also the policy. When a person has to leave a room uh, with one of these illnesses for tests or whatever, uh, they wear a mask. I see. So if masks were readily available then to help to contain this spreading, shouldn't everybody wear a mask? And because there's a lot of people who are walking around uh, without symptoms that are coughing or sneezing and potentially spreading the disease. Uh, yes, uh, um, maybe, but okay. again, unless you're in very close proximity to those people, I mean, so yeah, so we can talk about the mask in terms of protecting yourself. And so the WHO, the, the CDC recommendations and what I just told you tells you that they may not be that effective or right. necessary for that. Um, but I, but you're right. And I think that that has been at least part of the culture in places like Taiwan that the masks are not even just to protect you, but if everybody wears them, then you can then the sick people will will be prevented from spreading their disease to others. Others, so there is some rationale for that. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist, an expert in public health, so it's hard for me to know um, what the pluses and downsides downsides are exactly. So infectious disease physicians, we learn about diseases and how to treatment, but 
uh, treat them, but the spread of diseases through populations, that's actually a separate area of expertise that we're not necessarily always experts in, and that's what epidemiologists do. I see. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so I have another question. I know that uh, tests are kind of uh, few and far between in the U.S. right now, but if it, if you were like the the medical czar and, and tests were available, would you do you think it's a good idea that everybody be tested so we know who has and who doesn't, so we have better numbers? Yes. So in in the fantasy world where tests are unlimited and uh, cost nothing, um, sure. I think it, w it would make sense to go ahead and test everybody and, and test them every day um, and really be able to keep track. Um, you know, but that's obviously that's not possible. And so we have a limited number of tests. And at the moment, we, we have to really focus our testing on uh, the people that are most at risk that, and try to predict who's going to need medical care um, first and not waste tests on people who are otherwise um, well and low risk. Can you talk a little bit about the testing process? Like what, what sample is taken? How long does it take to process the test? We see pictures from, I think, from Korea where there's like drive throughs and it seems like the test could mm -hmm. be processed fairly quickly, but I get different information online. Yes. Uh, so there are, what, so in general tests for viruses, there are multiple types of tests. Um, this one right now that's being used is a direct detection test by a molecular method called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Basically, it is a way where you look for the genetic sequences of the virus. And so testing is focused on the obtaining samples where the virus is most likely to be found directly, which is, again, uh, respiratory secretions. And so the, as I told you, this virus does affect the upper respiratory tract as well as the lower. And so uh, what are nasal pharyngeal swabs or swabs that they stick up your nose uh, right now to collect kind of the, the secretions in your nose, those are what are being tested. Um, and once that swab is taken, in the laboratory, they extract that fluid and they extract all the RNA that's in that fluid. So most of that RNA will be from normal cells in your body. But if the virus is there, the viral RNA will be there as well. And then they will run the PCR and look for the viral RNA. So in completely ideal conditions, the test can be run and completed within about six hours. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So these drive-throughs that are happening, are they going, I assume then they have to get the results six hours later. Or the next well, day. yeah, so, you know, realistically, a, a lab can't run individual tests one by one. So usually what happens is that uh, they're batched and then run in big batches. Um, and so generally, you know, most labs are going to be reporting out the results next day. I see. Okay. Um, all right. I, I got a couple other questions here. Um, if I'm in a country where it seems like the, the, the government is not taking this seriously, and even in this country, there's some states that I hear, like, everybody's still out running around like everything's fine. What can I do to protect myself, or what kind of reasonable precautionary steps can I take? Good question. Yep. Uh, well, you can, you can um, obviously avoid areas that are crowded. So you want to avoid any areas where you can't control your space away from the other person, um, unless it's absolutely necessary. So obviously, if you're going to the airport for a necessary trip, you can't control that. Um, but uh, in general, you don't want to go to crowded type areas. So, And that's why, for example, all these sporting events have been shut down and concerts have been shut down because you're in a, in a tight audience and you can't um, control being close to somebody. So avoiding those areas. Um, and again, probably most of the infection is from environmental contamination and people touching. So uh, frequent hand washing, so soap and water are best, but, uh, but while you're away from soap and water, you can use any sort of uh, hand rub, hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol and uh, frequently uh, cleaning your hands after you've had to touch things. Um, that's the other major way. Um, 
And so those are really kind of it. I mean, those are the basic types of things to do. And so if you, you know, the very, very extreme case is that you completely lock yourself away and don't go at all, go out at all. Don't talk to anyone. Don't let anything in your house that's been outside and, and bleach everything. And, and that would be 100% that you don't get it, but that, that's not life. So you have to kind of weigh it and balance and live your life in a way that that is still acceptable, but um, minimize the risk as much as reasonable. Okay. Right. So there's risk of dying if you go out on the freeway in your car, but it's an acceptable, reasonable risk. And so we have to view things the same way with this and everything else in life that, you know, you, you there is some risk to being outside and there is some risk to being in routes, but if you, you know, do these things, make sure no one's coughing in your face, make sure you wash your hands, uh, you sanitize them, um, you know, the risk is, is minimal and acceptable. Okay. So it sounds like you don't want to expose yourself unnecessarily, but that also doesn't mean you have to be a hermit and lock yourself in a room. That is surely the safest way, but that's not also a way to live. Okay. So right. here's here's the question I have for you that uh, my wife's been like, because she like I said, she's Taiwanese, so she's getting double the information I'm getting, and she's concerned about ordering food or picking up fresh produce. And the like, if somebody's sick and they're preparing your food and they cough on that, okay, now what? So we're not eating a lot of vegetables right now. I have to say, my diet's not good right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, my wife's the same. So um, you know, so first of all, um, you know, probably most of the touching that's going on. Uh, on the outside, so in containers. So if you're worried about it um, and you're getting stuff delivered, um, you know, first thing to do is decontaminate the outside uh, before you. So again, um, alcohol works, uh, bleach works the best. So a very dilute bleach solution, so like 0.5% by volume um, is enough. And then the food itself. So again, soap and water actually are great for killing the virus. So anything that you can soak down is fine. So for example, a fruit that you're going to peel, you could, you could actually use your regular soap and water that you used to wash dishes to, to clean those off. Um, the other thing is that cooking. So the virus is very heat sensitive. So if you have a raw vegetable and you cook it, you're fine. That's okay. going to kill um, Salads, you know, obviously you don't cook, and so there you probably want to make sure you very thoroughly wash. Um, the other thing is cooked food that you're already getting. So maybe somebody already touched the pizza that you've got, and you're worried that the pizza has has uh, the virus on it. You can actually just reheat, recook, um, and you don't need to do it to an extreme. You don't have to burn your pizza. The virus is killed by... Um, 60 degrees centigrade for at least 10 minutes. And that translates to, I believe, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. For 10 minutes? So you could, yeah, for 10 minutes. So you could uh, heat it to that temperature for 10 minutes. So it may take some time to ramp up. So you could you could set your oven, you know, for 200 degrees or whatever, put your pizza in there for 15 minutes, and you don't have to worry about the virus. I see. Actually, very good tips there. Okay. So, honey, we can eat vegetables. We just need to cook them. Uh, my, my wife has gone to some, some extremes. We ordered a pizza the other day, and we're using tongs to open the pizza box. And it's like, I messed it up. And she's like yelling at me. It's like, I'm sorry. I'm new to this. Okay. Uh, I have a friend. His name is Dansky. And he, his wife is pregnant. And he's concerned about the baby inside. Uh, what does he need to be concerned about? And what kind of precautions can he take? Uh, yeah, so all the regular precautions that we just talked about, right? So if you don't get infected in the first place, there's nothing to worry about. Um, this is too new a disease really to know in terms of effects on pregnancy and babies. Um, there is a small amount of data that has come out in China that uh, seems to show actually that there was no effect on babies, that, that they were still born healthy. And that even uh, mothers who got, who were infected and breastfed, the babies actually seem still not even to get sick wow. from it. So, uh, you know, this, this, these are very small numbers of patients. And then the, the other caveat is that uh, these few pregnant women were actually, actually fairly late. I think they were, they were pretty much all third trimester, so there could be effects earlier in pregnancy. But 
Um, you know, we, we don't know, but there's no particular scientific reason to think that this virus should be uh, especially dangerous to, to um, babies and fetuses, but you know, we don't know. Okay, I noticed something. When you, when you mention this, and every time I hear the same thing, not to touch your face, I feel so compelled. Like there's an itch that develops on your face immediately as soon as you say that. Like I start to focus on that. I also notice that Ricky, Joan, and myself are doing our best not to cough. <laughs> I didn't hear one of you guys coughing over there. You better get away from me. Whoever. So it's like, it's kind of like we don't want to show that we're sick or, or but it seems like, like, what, what do we do here? It's like, the more we talk about it, the more I feel like I'm sick. Is it like a state of yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy here? It's like, I just want it to happen. Yeah. Uh yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, there, there are people, you know, there are people that study this and people will study every little thing. And I can't remember what the number was, but the average person touches their face like multiple times an hour. It's just, it's just what we do. Right. You know, yeah. So we should just wash our hands more often and. Yeah, right. If you touch right. your face with clean hands, you're okay. Yeah. So. I know what I'm doing right after this live stream. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got a couple more questions. I know that we're running short on time here, so I want to make sure I get some of these in. I want to also let Ricky okay. and Jonah know if there's a hot question that's coming in. There's a lot of people tuning in. It, just, it warms my heart to know that our community is coming together. There's 960 people who are tuning in, and usually we get about half that much for design. So this is a very uh, relevant, hot topic that everybody wants to talk about right now. So this has been helpful for me at least. I have so, a quick question. Okay, go ahead. Um, will summer kill it? A lot of people thinking that the warm climate will somehow kill the virus. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, we don't know the bottom line. Uh, so lots of viruses. So what you're, what you're referring to is that a lot of viruses are very, very seasonal, right? So flu is extremely seasonal. And interestingly, at least three of the other four of those common coronaviruses that cause common colds, uh, at least three of those four seem to be extremely seasonal as well. They, they almost completely disappear during the warm months. Um, and the original SARS actually was seasonal. So as far as we know, I mean, but it, it only lasted one season, but as soon as the weather warmed up, it disappeared. And it completely confused all the experts because everybody thought it was going to come back the next season. And it just disappeared and didn't come back. So will this virus behave that way? We don't know. Um, is the bottom line. There's a chance it may. And uh, even, but even historically, even seasonal viruses, uh, when they first made their de de debut in the population, oftentimes they've not shown seasonality uh, until after the first or two years um, as they kind of settle into the population. So even if this one is seasonal, it, it may not show that pattern the first season. Uh, but this is all, you know, theoretical hand-waving. Um, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Very true. I also just have one more question right now. What would you say, because we're getting a lot of people listing their symptoms, what would be your advice to people listing their symptoms in the chat when they're worried? So, again, fever, cough are the big ones. Um, if, if you're overall a healthy person and you have a runny nose, that is, suggests that it's much more likely another virus, but it doesn't rule it out. Um, generally, I think you're best off just isolating yourself, uh, wearing a mask so that you don't get other people sick. And that, you know, that this is common for, even if this were not uh, a season where this new coronavirus is here, that makes sense anyway, because flu and other viruses are spread that way. Uh, and it's just good public policy not to spread those to other people as well. And I would say, you know, if you're older, so, you know, 50s, 60s, especially 60s and above, I think, um, and you're starting to get short of breath, uh, or you have other chronic medical conditions, like you've had an organ transplant, or you have poorly controlled diabetes. So if you have risks like that, then it's worth probably a call to your doctor. If you're otherwise young and healthy, and you're feeling okay, and you just have some cough and some fever, but you're feeling fine or, or not not short of breath, then I, you know probably you should just wait it out and see how things develop. Um, so I think that's that would be my general kind of guidelines. Thank you. 
I, I know there's some high profile celebrities now that have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. I think Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson and Idris Elba has they've been diagnosed with this. And I read recently that uh, that both Tom and his wife Rita have been released from the hospital. So that begs mm-hmm. the next question: is is there any evidence of a, of immunity or how long it lasts after you've recovered? Like once you get it and you're over it, are you now immune to it or do you get it again or can you spread it or what's what's the information on that yeah uh the immune system is a big black box Mm -hmm. and and it's very strange how the the immune system can be so effective against some viruses and and not so effective against others we don't know yet again it's too early um there are some intriguing reports that are not fully confirmed scientifically yet that some of these COVID-19 patients are actually getting reinfected um, within weeks. So, and and there are some studies, especially with the original SARS, that antibody responses seem to drop very quickly after infection. So it may be that immunity is not very long lasting, um, but that's right now, that's purely speculation based on preliminary information. Mm -hmm. But if that's true, that, that's bad news for a vaccine. Um, and if a vaccine is available, it might mean that it would have to be readministered very frequently if it works. Okay. Um, I've also been reading about things that they say more, more Americans are going to go bankrupt than that will be killed by the coronavirus. So there's definitely going to be an economic impact on us. And do you have, I, I know this, I mean, I'm asking you to kind of just give us your opinion on this, but in us kind of isolating and shutting down businesses, pretty much every business is shut down except for the essentials right now. Uh, is is the, the, the cure worse than the disease in this case? Are we being reactive to this in the right way? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, that's a very difficult question. Um, and above my pay grade, but, um, you know, I, I think just like the other things in life and just like things we were talking about just before, there needs to be a balance. So you really need to weigh risks versus, versus benefits. And I think this is a time and this is an issue that public health experts, uh, that the CDC should be working closely with government officials to, to decide where that balance should be, and also to put in place procedures to to minimize spread um, and keep businesses open as much as possible. So there there could be, for example, policies about uh, how how many people are allowed in the store at once, or you know, what kind of decontamination needs to be done in a store, um, and what surfaces or things like that. And unfortunately. Um, uh, it's our government and the CDC has shown just remarkable levels of incompetence. Mm. So I, you know, th- this is something, you know, we need leadership. Uh, we need, we need some sane, smart people to be leading the effort and, and not Kushner going onto Facebook asking a group of people that he doesn't know what to do. Right. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I would also put in a uh, pitch that Tony Fauci, head of NIID, who is in a, these current interviews, looks like he's hoarse uh, from talking and hasn't slept in a few weeks. Uh, he is a voice of authority and sanity and uh, needs to be listened to uh, rather than just pushed into the corner and ignored by our president. Thank you for saying that. I, I have seen Dr. Fauci uh, on many platforms. I was like, how is this guy getting around so much? And you just explained it. He's probably not sleeping a whole lot right now. It, it does seem like uh, um, our, our leaders are starting to respond to this and treating it seriously and not spreading more misinformation. So I have some hope, not a lot of hope for our, in our leadership. But I wanted to ask you this question about why why culturally or, or uh, why is it that Taiwan and did you say Singapore are seemingly like model countries on how they're responding? What, what is it about these countries that are allowing them to, to really minimize the amount of infections? I think it's a lot of factors. So one, I think it is competent 
uh, leadership. So in Taiwan, for example, I'm sure your wife has also seen, uh, they have the, their health authorities have been extremely uh, transparent and very uh, responsive to the public and disseminating information as much as possible. Um, and they acted very, very quickly. So they, they started putting policies into place before there was even the first case in Taiwan. Um, the other thing I think is that the public has been much more um, taking, has been much more responsive and in taking action and listening to those recommendations. And I think they learned from SARS. So SARS was big in Taiwan. And so I think the public took this threat much more seriously from the beginning um, also. And so I think a combination of these types of factors, um, I think is the reason. Mm. It seems that we've been very fortunate in America, at least that uh, mayors and SARS didn't really have a giant impact here at all. And now this is our chance to, to kind of deal with an infectious disease. So I think hopefully this is a huge learning opportunity about the importance of a clear-headed leadership, competent leadership, as you say, moving forward, that the, the people that we elect into office actually do play a big role in moments of crisis like this. But what do you think the new reality is going to be for America? Like, uh, assuming that in, in a year or two where we're, we're way past this, what, 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 what do you think we'll, we'll have learned and what will we institute in the future? Um, yeah, so I, I hope that this teaches the public to take these things more seriously. And I hope it motivates our government to invest in your infrastructure. So, you know, I heard Trump's talk today about how the CDC is an outdated um, institution and uses outdated policies and was never designed to respond to this type of situation. And that's just completely, completely wrong. Um, the CDC, until you know, the last few years was the leading authority in the United States. It was the model for how things should be done. Um, it was prepared to deal with new situations. It sent teams all over the world when there were new outbreaks, uh, like Ebola outbreaks, because the government and the funding, um, people in the government funding the CDC realized that what happens there affects us here. Uh, on top of the fact that we just simply should care what happens to other people rather than not caring and thinking it doesn't affect us. Um, so I, I think, I hope the big lesson also is that there needs to be infrastructure for and support for the CDC and for scientists that are doing work related to infectious diseases. Mm. Okay, uh, so you had mentioned earlier that uh, people are following you on social media. Where are you, like if they want to get more information from you, where should they follow you? What platform are you on? Uh, I'm in, um, stupidly, I'm on Facebook under my own name. <laughs> so that's how they follow you yeah. there on Facebook then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's, is, is it just Otto Yang, do you know that, that that's your Facebook? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Okay, I'll share that information yeah. in a second. There are, there are a couple of other auto, auto Yangs. I don't know if they're real or not. Uh, there, I know <laughs> there's at least one other auto Yang somewhere out there, but yeah, which is weird. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I searched for you, a couple have popped up, and I'm like, no, that's not you. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is, we're here in Los Angeles. Like, wh where can I get a test? I don't even know where I'm supposed to go if I want to get a test. Good question. Yeah. Um, well, you would go through your own regular doctor. Okay. And then the, the doctor could then um, contact pub, public health authorities about getting the test. That, at least that's the way it's working right now. Um, as testing becomes more available, um, it may reach the point that your local doctor can order it themselves. But for right now, the testing is being prioritized and decided mostly by public health authorities. Ooh, that's scary. So at UCLA, yeah, at UCLA, for example, only a limited number of people can order. So we have now got testing up and running in-house in our laboratory here. Um, and it's really limited just to emergency room and infectious disease physicians at the moment. I see. So if I call my general physician and say, like, I've got this cold flu, whatever I got for two and a half weeks, my throat's sore, can I get tested? They're going to 
most likely say no then? They're going to say, yeah, they're going to say, say that um, if it looks suspicious and you're getting sick, that they'll call the public health department I see. and try to get approval to get tested. Are there any estimates as to when more tests will become readily available? Uh, yeah, I think some of that was mentioned um, actually in the press conference this morning. So there are private companies that are now trying to fill the gap that the CDC has left. Um, so I think it's anticipated within the next few weeks. Okay. All right. So you guys, we just need to stay healthy for a little bit here and then more tests will become available. Hopefully fingers crossed. And yeah. And you have to do, you do have to remember that overall the mortality is not that high. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so yeah, it, it is horrible to think about there being a mortality of, of half a percent, but on the other hand, that means that 99 and a half percent. Uh, don't die. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the mortality is probably at least partially related to the medical care you get. So most people die from uh, lung failure and they can be helped through that by putting being put on a breathing machine on a ventilator. Um, so uh, you know, a lot of people can be saved if we don't let the epidemic spread too fast and overwhelm our hospitals so that we don't have enough ventilators. So protecting yourself will also serve that. It'll actually reduce mortality overall for other people uh, or yourself if you are unlucky enough to get sick. Um, so, you know, I think, think it, everything is intertwined and linked and kind of points to it being important that we all take our own personal responsibility. And I, I think the other interesting thing to keep in mind is this age gap, age thing that we talked about. So if you're young and healthy, you probably have much, much, it's not that you won't get sick and it's not that you can't die, but you're much, much less likely um, for that to happen. Right. But also for that same reason, if you go visit your grandparents or your parents who are a little older, you may be putting them at risk, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So take all precautions that you can. So make sure before you go see them that your hands are clean, that if you have any sort of illness, either don't see them or wear a mask and make sure that you're wearing you know, clothes. Everything has been decontaminated before you're touching them or touching stuff in your house. Right. So, Ricky, did you hear that? Make sure when you go visit your parents, keep your clothes on and don't touch anybody. <laughs> don't try. Don't try. Okay, so before we say goodbye to you, uh, Dr. Yang, uh, being respectful of your time, I, I know you have a lot of things to do. Is there anything else you want to tell us before we kind of end the live stream here? Well, um, I hope that you, the take-home lesson is that you, you can, you know, know, if you understand how the virus spreads, you can definitely protect yourself. And in protecting yourself, you're protecting everyone around you as well. Um, People should not panic. They should not be buying up supplies and everything to the point that it's hurting others. So try to be responsible about that. Um, and, you know, we are going to get through this. So I, I just, I think that we should just be careful and measured and concerned, but not um, panicking. Okay. There you have it, you guys. Dr. Yang, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so my this pleasure. is how, uh, this is, uh, whoops, I just jumped past jumped my slide here. Gun. Hold on, give me a second, guys. <laughs> I totally messed up. Okay, Dr. Yang, you guys can find more information about him just on plain old Facebook, old-fashioned Facebook, Otto Yang. And there's many, so just match the face, the name, the profile to the person. Uh, I, I guess that's it for us. You guys stay tuned a little bit. We're going to do another live stream. We're going to do a fireside chat. I'll give information as to how to join that in a little bit. And that's it, guys. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. We'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Hey, thank you so much. Sure, my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.